The Christian life is filled with paradoxes. The way to be free from sin is to become a slave of Christ. The way to find true and eternal life is to die to yourself. Leaders are called to serve. Jesus is king, but he was crucified like a common criminal. The wisdom of God is seen as foolishness by the world, and the love of God is revealed when he disciplines his children. Sounds like what we've been talking about a little bit the last couple of weeks. Consequences, right? Mm-hmm. And how God places you in places for a reason, and you should do what he wants you to do. Right. I would say so. Having said that, Jesus is honored even when his followers get mistreated in the whole mess. In fact, in today's session, what we're going to do is examine, actually, you said paradox, but we're going to look at how um, being persecuted by the world leads to joy in Christ. Honestly, most of us don't even get to suffer the way the early disciples did, and I'm actually grateful for that because they were pretty much killed in the streets, stoned to death. I mean, they had their head cut off. Right. I mean, one was crucified upside down. There you go. I mean, this is crazy the way that that was. We have it pretty easy nowadays that compared to then. But we do still face opposition in other forms. Um, and Jesus did expect, well, he expected all that to happen. If the world persecuted him, it certainly is going to give us persecution as well. Right. There's no reason for it not to be, you know? Mm -hmm. um, we thank God, though, because he definitely helps us to have the strength to go through whatever happens. He'll get us through anything, anytime, any trouble. He's there for us. And he encourages us, and I encourage you to always keep your faith there in God, because even in the times of trouble, he is there. And he will lead you to whatever point or purpose that the whole situation has that you're in it does have a part of his plan even when it feels like you don't understand what's going on or you just can't handle it anymore or you're just completely lost mm -hmm. if anything that's when you need to be praying even more right absolutely that's when you need to be saying god help me mm -hmm. but don't get so upset that you say i don't understand what you're doing god and i give up or start making new rules and not turn into the Bible or changing the words of the Bible and trying to make things just convenient so you can fall back into a sin or do something that's more convenient for you just because inconvenience is something you're not really wanting to deal with or change, which I think has a lot to do with this week's lesson too because ultimately people do not like change. Mm -hmm. People like to adjust to their own ways and their own things, including especially in this being an election year for the United States, I think it's really important to throw it out there Government officials, government officials and the way that all that works, if they see something not going a certain way, believe me, they're not going to like it. People in authority do not like it when they're undermined. Right. And you see that story time and time again if you open up the Bible. You see it where people just, why did he get crucified? What was the real reason? Whenever he was healing people, apparently they didn't think that was a good thing at all, did they? Right. People like to accommodate their sin, and when you call them out on that, they get upset. What I need you guys to see is that when you have any type of opposition, it can actually be a blessing, and you can actually use it to even dive even deeper into actually God's love and your purpose for you, though, or your purpose for us as a whole. Because whenever things go wrong, a lot of times... When you get through that, whatever it might be, however you get through it, mm -hmm. you have a testimony. Mm -hmm. You also have purpose and feel like you've accomplished something. And if you know that you prayed and the Lord helped bring you through something, it really can change you and make you a better person. And it also can give you that confidence you need to face whatever else might come your way. It's pretty cool because that really does kind of, it really does kind of strengthen you as a Christian. And, you know, we're talking about how this was an early church and how everything was going on recently in the last couple of weeks and how God, you know, had consequences whenever the people were actually doing what they weren't supposed to and they lied. You know, you can't lie to God. You can't lie to the Holy Spirit. It's there and you just got to do what needs to be done, right? Mm -hmm, right. We're all going to receive punishment someday. And sometimes you get the punishment here on earth, as we already discussed. But I tell you one thing. Just like with consequences, if you do what you're supposed to do, 
there's that sense of closeness, that sense of reward, that that worthiness, that knowing that you're doing what you're doing and it's right for God. Now, you're not doing it to be recognized or called out for whatever reason, but it does seem to show. And you start to see that, you know, when we start talking about these verses this week, you're going to kind of see that a little bit and see how God starts to work with you in a personal relationship even. Looking at what was going on with the early church, if we look back at that again, as the church was committed and you see all those believers that are starting to show up, you see Luke's going to talk a little bit about how opposition was also easy to start intensifying with what was going on. People wanted to be committing their lives to Christ, and it's something that was, well, basically Jesus made it clear that people need to count the cost of the discipleship before making the decision to follow him. Um, people were wanting rewards, and you don't get a reward without actually doing the work for it, right? In other words, there is some consequences to that, and that is you have to be ready for whatever might come that way. And if you tell God you're going to do something, you need to definitely do it. Give up that sin. Do whatever needs to be done, because it's not good if you don't do follow through what you're supposed to, right? We're looking at these verses, and we're just going to kind of, before we get into them, I just kind of wanted to point out, as we get into this, you start seeing whenever the church leaders or people that actually were religious and in the area started having these changes and things happening, people start getting arrested. And you start seeing a lot of conflict and you see things happening, especially, you know, there's a lot of talk about Peter and John and the other apostles, but really and truthfully, they would end up like even in prison and persecuted just for basically doing what Jesus told them to go do going and talking about what they saw and what they knew, what pretty much is the New Testament, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's quite something, because they would continue to do that even though they would be told not to. Um, the high priest and all of the people that were there that were leaders and stuff, you had all of their efforts going on to do different things, but no matter what, even after being arrested, these guys they didn't stop doing what they were told to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we need to really get out of this week's lesson. Are you doing it for God? Or are you doing it for yourself? Are you doing it for the world? Who really runs this world nowadays? And how much of a wonderful world do we actually have? I mean, I'll tell you, God's still in control of my life, and I hope he is yours, no doubt. But we need to just kind of point out that when you're looking at something like this, you say, well... What are we going to do if the government tells us to do this or if they're to do that? Well, first of all, don't worry about what hasn't happened already. Right. If you do that, you're already depending on something that may not happen. Because for all we know, you could pass away today or God could come back and say enough and it be over. Now, whatever the case may be, if you got anxiety, then you're doing wrong. You need to give any kind of concern to God and let him handle it. That's the first thing that I need to throw at you. The next thing I need to throw out is that going back to these people that were actually locked up and we said how sad that was and how they were persecuted, when they really did need help of all things, God will turn a situation around. Remember I said that? Your worst situation can become a testimony. testimony. Right. Well, of all things, guess what he done? <laughs> You're going to love what he did because he actually sends them help from someone who you would never expect. Anybody know what he did? I'm going to go ahead and just let you know. They had angels that would even set them free. I think that's absolutely amazing, don't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, you see that they're in a jail cell, and that's where they're put, and the police couldn't keep them down or do anything because after they did that, they would be challenged and yet refused to do what the leaders commanded. Peter would be sitting there talking to them and saying things that was going to go on, and yet the biggest thing that he just kept reminding them was Jesus was Messiah, and they would remain faithful to the calling to others about him, even if it means upsetting other people. I mean, come on, guys. That's pretty amazing, don't you think? Yeah, it is. You're talking about the same angel that told them to go back to the temple and continue to preach about Jesus is the one that had all these people enthusiastically obeying the command here. And I think that's pretty amazing. I mean, despite all the efforts of these people, they just didn't stay in jail long. They would be right back out on the street, and they'd be doing what they did best, letting people know what Jesus told them to do. 
letting people know what happened. What are we doing for Christ? You got to ask that. In today's session, we're going to look at these leaders and we're going to ramp up and see their intensity that they did in attacking the church. As you do look at the verses for today, I want you to think about your attitude towards suffering and how God wants you to respond with his actual glory. We're going to go ahead and pray real quick, guys. I want you to join us with that. It's very important that we do pray and we let people know about God and we pray with them when they need prayer. There's several requests. If you have them, you can always send them to us. We even do unspoken. We just want to make sure that we get them all in there. Um, of course, being the founder of Truth Inspired, I have a lot of notes, a lot of messages that I do get, but I'm going to get to them sooner or later. And whenever I do, I do make sure that I get to every one of them. And, you know, if for some reason you feel like you send something and we don't respond, send it again because sometimes things don't go through. But I can guarantee you this. We're always willing to pray. We pray for some people that had surgery this week. We pray for some people who's had other issues this week with looking for work. I know I was praying with somebody about that. We don't mind praying with you. That's an important thing, like I already said. We want to go out there and do God's will. That's a big part of it. Father in heaven, thank you for all your many blessings. We just ask that you be with us and bless us. I'm coming to you asking that we get something out of this today. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Leading us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, just be with us and bless us as we learn more about what these people did and how you were able to bless them and how you can bless us and what we should do in the world, Lord. We need you more than ever. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name I pray. You're with us always and forever. Amen. Amen. Socasty, thank you, Pastor Lane. I want to throw that out there because we wouldn't have these verses to even look at if we didn't have some help from you guys. And this wonderful church, you guys need to check it out, Socasty Baptist, if you don't have a church of your own. Even if you do, you need to check out their webpage because I'm going to tell you right now, they have some good guest speakers. They also have some good sermons that is always on there where they have the services each week. And, you, you know, you'll get a blessing from that. I know I do. And it's a good place to start if you don't have a place to go to. And we thank you guys for checking in with us as well. Thank you, um, of course, to the people who help us read and do other stuff with Truth Inspired, Bob and Jeremiah, they've really been helpful with us. You know, that's been really cool lately, having somebody else to help read. That's always easy for me to do whenever you guys say all the hard names. <laughs> so, but I do appreciate your help and thank you for that. And thanks to all you who are our followers and people that help us and sharing and just doing what needs to be done because we're definitely growing. And I invite you to share even Testimonies of Faith, our new page, but you um keep checking out these bible lessons too because we're going to keep doing them no matter how hard they can get some weeks there's some weeks that they're really good lessons to learn and i hope you guys are getting something out of them in today's session we're going to actually look at those leaders like i said and how they attack the church and see what's going on a little bit about suffering and what god might be wanting you to do responding in a way that's to his glory you get what i'm saying Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. Let's go ahead and get it going on because Acts 5, 29 through 33. I need to get somebody to read Acts 5, 29 through 33. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Okay, like I told you, um, I wanted to reveal what had happened with different things going on with the angels letting them out and doing mm -hmm. different things. I think you need to understand that because that's a pretty big thing. Can you imagine teaching after somebody arrests somebody, they're in prison, and yet somehow you see them on the street? Right. God can do that. I'm telling you, he can do amazing things. And as we're breaking this down, first thing that I'm going to start seeing in these verses is we ought to obey God. Because mm -hmm. guess what? You're not going to see or experience what these guys experienced unless you truly are in it 100% for God. You got to trust God, you got to give it to God, and you're going to see things, no matter what, you're going to see things godly if you just take off the blinders of this world, because something is always happening that shows God's wonderful, amazing power. 
this world just would not function without God because he's the creator. Look around, you'll find things all the time. Just like seasons change with the snow and stuff and you'll see something pop out where you wouldn't expect it, like a flower in the snow or something. Mm -hmm. It's amazing when you see something like that, isn't it? Yeah. Well, so is anything that God does. So we, you know, that's all the pre proof you should need is just by trusting in faith by the Bible. And when we look at verse 29, you see ought to obey God. You know, on trial again, you're seeing Peter actually, you have that obligation to obey God. He's saying not that uh, Christians should ignore authority, but instead he's actually acknowledging that God's command will take priority over the human life. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal, guys. No matter what, are you putting God first? God of our fathers, you know, that's the next verse. He's reminding those leaders that Jesus represented the whole fulfillment of God's promises of their fathers being that of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, the prophets also, you know, that had foretold the coming of Messiah. And Jesus' identity as Messiah is validating that he was raised up by God and the Jewish leaders played a role in Jesus' death by hanging him on a tree, but his resurrection reveals his true identity. And, you know, in verse 30, we see ye slew. Well, they're referring to there, Jesus' death played out according to the Father's plans. He voluntarily surrendered, surrendered his life, actually, for sins, and that determined when he would take his final breath, even. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, Peter's emphasizing that people are indeed held accountable for their actions. So let's not leave that out. You know, you see that happen in verse 30 also, because 31 you have exalted. The word exalt is important because Peter is actually declaring that the murder of an innocent man resulted in his actual exaltation and him moving up the ladder, I guess you could say, and the way all of us do when we give our lives to Christ, right? You kind of see where I'm coming with that? Mm -hmm. Paul does the same thing later on. I mean, you see the same thing happening, and it's kind of elaborated on a little bit about the suffering of Jesus and how it led to him being ex his being exalted, actually. And you see how he takes on the seat by the Father with Jesus. You know, you see what's happening with that. One day you have... Um, well, you have the glory that's going to be complete with every human who actually bows down to him, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing that gets me is Peter also is very quick to let people know that Jesus came to earth as a man. So he never even completely relinquished that humanity in that sense. He, you know, he's still fully human, but just as he is fully God. Right, right. And Both. the humanity is important because only a human could actually die for human sins. Mm -hmm. At least that's the way God's plan works. And, of course, God's plan is perfect. So right. you got to follow through with that. It's pretty amazing. It is. Um, how do we even get to be a part of this? Well, you can start with repentance. Um, you see that in verse 31. Forgiveness, repentance, it implies a changing direction. It's necessary response to the gospel. A key aspect of even that is saving grace. Um, forgiveness. You know, repentance, forgiveness, it's kind of like two sides of the same coin because when we come to Jesus in repentance and faith, then he forgives us. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. I can't get over how many people think that they just think that they're going to do or say one thing or be a good person and get to heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm actually scared of how many Christians... Or people who think that they are Christians may end up in hell. It does scare me, but there's no point to worry about something I can't do anything about. Or can I? And you can too. What do I mean? Pray. Let's pray for anyone who you're concerned about, including always yourself, making sure that you're always clear with God and you repent it on a regular basis. And you stay right with God and your life is changing. Because we have to be witnesses, you know, and do what needs to be done. In verse 33, you see, cut to the heart. The religious leaders were so angry that they wanted to kill the apostles. Um, they had let Peter and John off with a warning in chapter 4. But you see right away, things just started changing rapidly. And um, one of the lessons that you learn from Luke's account here is that we should expect some to reject Jesus and turn to the opposition 
especially if you're giving out the name of Christ and you're turning to him. And of course, the people who are in authority are not going to like that mm -hmm. or the people who have set in their ways. Or sometimes you even hear the phrase hardened heart. You know how that works. Right. So right. this is important that we get that down and understand that. Um, when you're looking at this, we need to read a little more here. If we look at um, what's going on, I think in our reading today, you're getting mostly an idea of what's happening with truth and Jesus and how that happens. And you're hearing stuff that's going on that motivates people to do things even despite consequences. Does that make sense? I think that sums up the whole thing almost. Is basically, I even see Peter as someone who perhaps even ruffled the feathers of these guys and causing some issues here that they didn't like. You see that as a good example of what's happening. God's trying to watch out for him, though, and other apostles. In fact, he still does and helps them in unexpected sources like the angel letting them out whenever that would happen, right? Right. Or in this case, you know, you got other things that happen. I mean, jail cells open, and I can't get over that. That's something that just amazes me. Can you imagine somebody being let go by God? I, you, you actually have that happen, though. If you give your life to God, your sins are let go if you completely give it to him. So guess what? He's opened the gates to heaven. I want to throw that out because if we had a Bible skill this morning and I had you read different verses, one of the number one verses that I would have you read is 2 Corinthians 5.17. And the reason why I throw that one out there is because it says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Okay, let's get the whole verse in here. In fact, I, I don't know if somebody can turn to it or not. But if we were to read a little bit more of it, I think if we were to actually take it 2 Corinthians and do 5, 11 through 21, you'd get an even bigger detail. Knowing therefore the fear of the Lord, we use persuasion to men, but to God we are manifest. And I trust also that in your consciences we are manifest. We commend not ourselves again to you, but give you occasion to glory in our behalf that you may have somewhat to answer them who glory in face and not in heart. For whether we be transported in mind, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for you. For the charity of Christ presseth us, judging this, that if one died for all, then all were dead. And Christ died for all, they that they also who live may not now live to themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, we know no man according to the flesh, and if we have known Christ according to the flesh, but now we know him so no longer. If then any be in Christ a new creature, the old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. I but, think that says it all right there. Wouldn't you say? Mm-hmm. That right there, but continue finishing. But all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. For God indeed was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing to them their sins, and he hath placed in us the word, the word of reconciliation. For Christ, therefore, we are ambassadors, God, as it were, exhorting by us, for Christ, we beseech you, be reconciled to God. Him who knew no sin, he hath made sin for us, that we might be made the justice of God in him. Okay, now, that being said, it just, like I said, it kind of speaks for itself. A mm -hmm. new creation is very important. Believers can stand with confidence. There's no doubt in that, absolutely. You don't want to forget that. Knowing, you know... The gospel has passed the test of time even. That's the main reason people say why or they want to understand things. Throw them, throw them out the Bible and explain how long it's been here. That by itself is probably the biggest argument because over 2,000 years of Christians in history proven, you know, that you see the Christ has the church and it survived even some of the strongest opposition that it's had over the years. It still exists. Mm -hmm. Um 
such power does not come just from people being believers or doing what a government tells them to do or something that's just fictional, fictional like a fairy tale or something. No, right. there's only one way that something could be around for 2,000 years. Also, have the number one selling book still to this day in time has been the Bible. And you know what? There's only one way to do that, and that is, of course, the one who we believe in, the maker, the one who does it all. That just explains it to me because there's just no such power that lies in man. It has to be the one who we believe in, right? Right. And I just think that's the number one argument if you got somebody who's giving you a hard time over something or doesn't want to believe, pray about them, don't give up on them, but know that you stand in confidence because it's real. There's proof of it. And as you get to know God, guess what? You're going to see even more proof because he's going to work with you just like he did with these guys with different things. And you're just going to start seeing things that are amazing. You're, you're not going to believe it. So I wanted to point that out. Somebody read Acts 5, 34 through 39 for me. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little spaces and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up the Theodos, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, as many obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the day of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot other overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. Okay, now looking at this, you basically see that there's a use of historical examples that's being used to appeal to the religious leaders, logic and reason. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you start talking logical, a lot of times they'll start to believe you, but that's just the thing. The more that we look at this, the more there's plenty of accounts through time and through things that point to everything that we're talking about being real and needing to be taught, right? Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, just another thing who you were talking about there, that actually was the one who mentored Paul. Gamaliel? Yes. Okay. So just kind of something interesting there. Throw that one out there. Because um, I thought that was kind of neat. You see, there's tell as old as time. We pass the information to other people, don't we? Right. And, of course, we learned a lot from Paul, didn't we? Mm -hmm. So I tell you, it's amazing how things get passed on down through us doing what needs to be done, witnessing to others, teaching people, helping them. Before you know it, God's using us to just continue to spread everything the way that it needs to be done, and people just get to know what they need to know, and it just keeps... You see many and more times for, well, believers get to rejoice because they get more and more opportunities to honor Jesus, mm -hmm. right? All right, let's look over here at Acts 5, 40 through 42. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every hour, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Okay, so now you're seeing that part beaten. Um, they basically, you know, had a little thing going here where the religious leaders had actually taken the advice and released all the apostles, but not before they actually abused them. Um, mm -hmm. In this case, beating them meant striking them with a whip or a rod. Um, the Old Testament limited the number of lashes to usually uh, 40 lashes so that they didn't humiliate the person that's actually being punished. I think you can find that in Deuteronomy. They talk a little more about that. Um, 25.3, I believe, is the verse that talks about that. But I'm bringing that up because when you start looking at this, you get into what's happening to them. And all of those apostles, they have things happen to them. But, you know, Jesus was mocked and ridiculed before being executed. And he had actually predicted that abuse 
told the disciples that they should expect persecution for his sake also. So, you know, again, back to what we were talking about, if they take persecution and they go through what they did, we should be on the guard for that ourselves. You never know what's going to happen. Are we going to be strong enough to take whatever comes? Verse 40, you see, commanded that they should not speak. Along with that physical punishment, the religious leaders threatened the apostles, demanding they stop talking about Jesus. Um, they were paying attention to the words when they would say the name of Jesus and then relate his authority that would be over all the followers that he had. And the believers would then start focusing on Jesus's name. And as that started happening, you started seeing really a lot more of the suffering and you started seeing what was happening come to light a little more. Um, I think that's something to note because John and Peter had already heard and ignored the warning from the religious leaders. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's quite something. Um, well, what do we do and how do we handle all this? Verse 41, you see the word rejoicing. They found joy in suffering, shame for the sake of Jesus. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Later on, you find in Corinthians, Paul wrote about God's grace and how it was sufficient to me. That's right. And allowed them to take, you know, slimmer things that were happening. You see suffering for the Savior. In 2 Corinthians 12, 10, you find, you know, James, um, he was encouraged to count it all the joy. Um, there were several trials and there was different things that happened where there was suffering for Christ. But it seems to lead to rejoicing in Christ because suffering leads to even sharing more of Christ's glory. How in the world do we get through this nowadays when we get upset over just not having what we want happen in one day? And I'll tell you right now that they would actually have some of this stuff happen to them that was like being beat. Right. And yet rejoicing. Well, I'll throw you a verse out there for that one, Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. And again, I say. Rejoice. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty powerful. I think it is anyway, because it doesn't say we should be complaining about everything. It says rejoice. rejoice. Mm -hmm. That means in everything, right? They cease not. You see that in verse 42. So they were able to do it. Despite the leader's warnings and everything, they still kept preaching and teaching about Jesus all around and doing what needed to be done. No threat would stop them, right? How far are you willing to go for God? That's something to ask yourself. Are you even following God? That's something we still need to ask some people still to, to this day. Some people think they are and they're not. Good people are not necessarily saved. And there's going to be a lot of things that happen that we ask, have to kind of look to for when judgment comes. We would need to be careful about this, right? So we break it down a little bit. To finish off, we just basically see that... Um, they knew what was going on, and they knew that God had the final authority. Nothing that was outside of his plan would ever happen to them, and they actually considered it as an honor to suffer for Christ. That pretty much is it in the ballpark, guys. Um, so summarizing, believers can expect some of the rejection of the truth of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That happens when you go out and do his will. It happened to us recently when I gave somebody a cross. The mom got upset. I told you all that story not too long ago. Right. I just stood there, took the cross back. I said a prayer and still pray for the young boy because he was so scared of his own mother hiding behind a pole at the gym. That's just sad. But you know what? He did, the seed was planted. He did ask about that cross and he did get to know about it. So I prayed that maybe he'll follow through with that and God will use that as an example. Don't think God won't use you and don't think that things will not be rejection sometimes because it does happen. Believers can stand with confidence though knowing the gospel passes the test of time. 2,000 years, guys, it's still going strong. Believers can rejoice with every opportunity to honor Jesus. And, you know, I just tell you that even though in some regions Christians are still persecuted for their faith, we're fortunate that in America and around this world, we generally don't care about it like what happened back then. That being said, our memory verse is Acts 5.32 this week. You guys make sure you check that out. 
Um, we want to make sure you see what's going on with it because that's always good to study and see what's happening. And I say now, why don't we just do our prayer? So as we end in prayer, I just ask right now you guys pray with us, okay? God bless us all, Lord. We're praying right now that you bless the people who suffer for you. Even today, God, we're asking for you to give us the boldness to witness on your regular basis. Bless us. Bless the unsaved, our friends, our neighbors, people we know that may be encountering and that may not have you in their life or need you in their life. And God, we all need you. So please help us do what needs to be done to get that out there, to let them know what's happening, to do what needs to be done. Lord, I'm praying for believers who are suffering for their witnessing and praying for those that are that are actually knowing that you are the one that gives us boldness to get out there and do what needs to be done as a witness every single day. Lord, I pray that each and every one of the people hearing this gets a chance to be a witness and understand what it's like to be a part of your whole circle of what you do and how you mold, make, and shape people, no matter what happens in life, God. I'm praying that someone comes back and gets to tell us about something that happens. Maybe it's not, not, not even a good situation, but where they got through it and you helped them get through it where they actually were doing something for you and maybe they had something that was not so easily to handle. Maybe they had to endure some kind of thing that happened and, and something that was very hard to deal with, but you got them through it, God, especially if it means that they were able to do what you need them to be and say as a witness for you, Lord. That's so amazing, Lord, that we can actually go out and do your will and pray and be with others. Lord, I pray that no matter what, that you help us and that you be with us and that you stay with us, even if it means we have to get through a difficult situation, giving us, Lord, the strength, energy, and guidance to do your will. Thank you for everything, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. That's Truth Inspired.